You right? Yes. All right. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all this morning, and uh, particularly uh, Artie from North Bourne, we uh, give you a warm welcome this morning, uh, Artie. And also we noticed the return of uh, uh, Bernard and Hillary, and uh, we give you thanks for your return. Uh, and um, what, what was that? <laughs> so you're like a newcomer then, are you, Bernard? <laughs> so uh, right, uh, I don't think we have any other ones there. We're a bit light on this morning, but um, we welcome you all. Uh, also, remind you that next uh, Wednesday at one thirty, we'll have our um, uh, we'll resume our sweet hour of prayer at 1.30 next Wednesday. Also next Friday, for those that are members of the Board of Management, the meeting is at 1 o'clock uh, next Friday. And uh, also, um, I was a bit remiss last week in as much as I think uh, being the, the new year, and uh, haven't consulted the birthday calendar, and uh, I missed uh, Will's uh, gre uh, birthday greetings for last Friday. So you've only got five years to go to get that telegram, Will. So, uh, so congratulations. And also next Friday, uh, we have another birthday in the proceedings, and that's Shirley. So, uh, and. As always, the young ladies are always 21 years of age. So uh, uh, we wish you well for your birthday and also for the wild luncheon that has been planned for you. So uh, good, Shirley. Uh, I think that's all at the moment. And uh, the uh, and next Sunday... Uh, Graham will be resuming his uh, current series. So, uh, thank you, Graham. Thank you, Keith. And uh, a warm welcome to you this morning from me as well. It's really particularly glad to uh, welcome you to church today. Shall we uh, pray together, a prayer of invocation? Let's not presume on God's presence or mercy, but let's come asking for it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation of Jesus to come to you, not only as his Father, but ours too. We ask that for his sake, you will draw near to us in this hour and make this hour precious for each one of us. However we might have thought this morning, as we prepared to come to church, help us now to be your church through him. Amen. The opening hymn is number 300, oops, 248. Ah, it's Jesus Stand Among Us. It's 325 in Rejoice. <laughs> this is one of those tricks that I'm learning. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, uh, I have used the old version of the hymn for those of you who like RCH, Alistair, Will. I'm sure there are others as well. But you'll have to find it. It's, uh, it's 248 in the blue book. It's 325 in the red book. And... <laughs> in the good book. Okay. Just because your Bible has the hymns as well. I've got one of those. All right. There's a prayer, this song. Jesus, stand among us. So let's, let's join together to sing this uh, lovely old hymn.
lovely to see you all. Um, so I decided this week I would talk about two special women. And I'm going to talk about two women, mainly one, but two women that this time last week I had never heard of, never heard of. Um, we almost missed watching the Australia Day Awards ceremony on Monday evening. It was in the ABC, I think, at 7.30, and we were so glad we saw it. Anyway, of these two women, one was born in Australia and is still alive. The other was born in Scotland and died many years ago, even before we were born in Scotland. So back to the award ceremony, you probably all know by now that the 2021 Senior Australian of the Year is a uh, Dr. Miriam Rose Ungunmer Bauman. I have to look for the second part of her name, which is her original name. She's an Aboriginal elder from Daly River in the local language Nauyu, which is near Catherine in the Northern Territory. Although I had never heard of her. She is apparently a renowned artist, activist, writer and public speaker and the first Aboriginal person to become a fully qualified teacher in the Northern Territory. But underlying all these aspects of her identity is her faith in Christ. There was a, for those of you who get Eternity magazine online, there's an article about her there. She says, I'm beginning to hear the gospel at every level of my identity. I am beginning to feel the great need we have of Jesus to protect and strengthen our identity and to make us whole and new again. She wrote the foreword to a book produced by the Bible Society called Our Mob, God's Story, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Sharing Their Faith. It was published in 2017. The whole ceremony on Monday evening I found moving. There, you know, I think we've all been discouraged, not just by the pandemic, by, but by some of the other things happening in the world which we wish weren't happening, but there is so much good being done in the world and so much of it we don't hear about till it comes together in an award like this and not just the people who get the awards but the other nominees. Anyway, another thing that I really liked was the fact that um, I'll call her Dr Miriam Rose because it's easier for a Scot to say that. Um, she's a couple of years younger than us, but has much more difficulty getting around. And it was lovely to see both Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, and Bernie Shakeshaft from Armadale, who got the local hero, the local hero Australian of the Year award last year, and I spoke about him one Sunday. The help they gave her getting on and off the platform. And you could just tell little jokes were being made as they ushered her on and off. So there was this lovely human warmth in the middle of a relatively formal ceremony. It was a great night. But the other woman, the one who was born in Scotland and who died um, in the 40s before we were even born, she's called Jane Haining. When World War II broke out, Jane was working for the Scottish Mission School in Budapest. I didn't realise until we visited Budapest how, what close links there were, and hopefully still are, between Scotland and Budapest. I don't know if you know more about that, Tibor, but there's certainly, you know, even a bridge there that I think might have been designed by a Scot and Scottish labourers came to help with the building. Anyway, when it became obvious what was happening in Europe and that the Nazis were spreading out, 
this, the Church of Scotland called their missionaries home, in home to Scotland, including Jane. And she said, I'm not leaving. She was matron of this girl's boarding house, and she said, if these children needed me in days of sunshine, how much more do they need me in days of darkness? For the next five years, she had sheltered scores of Jewish refugees who arrived from Nazi Europe. She was arrested when the Nazis invaded Hungary and was sent to Auschwitz. And I think I missed, I forgot to look here as Graham told me, have you, you've shown that, yes. This is, this photo was taken in 2017 when this lady was in 97 and she was one of the people that Jane Haining looked after. So I was really, Graham found that photograph and I was really delighted. Um, she was looked after by Jane Haining for six years from 1933 to 1939. But anyway, Haining was sent to Auschwitz. She didn't return. And she is one of the many non-Jews recognized as righteous among the nations by the state of Israel. I'd like to read a tribute to Jane written by one of the children, now an adult, whom she protected. I still feel the tears in my eyes and hear in my ears the siren of the Gestapo motor car. I see the sad smile on her face while she bade me farewell. I never saw Miss Haining again, and when I went to the Scottish mission to ask the minister about her, presumably after the war, I was told she had died. I did not want to believe it, nor to understand. But a long time later, I realized she had died for me and for others. The body of Miss Haining is dead, but her smile, voice and face are still in my heart. Among the, the memorials to Jane Haining are two stained glass windows in Queen's Park Church in Glasgow where she worshipped. And it, this really just tells that she was a devoted member of this church until 1932 when she went as matron to this school in Budapest and she worked there till she was taken prison by the Germans. It's a sad reflection on the history I was taught in a very good school in Glasgow that I had never heard of her and since she came to my awareness this week I've shared her with other Scottish friends who are saying the same thing. Anyway, finally, I have heard about her and thank God for her. We can't be sure of the exact time and nature of her death, but we know that like most people in Nazi concentration camps, she was starved. Two days before the date given as the official date of her death, she wrote a strange letter to a friend, and I'm amazed that this letter did get out and reach the friend. She was talking about fresh fruit and fresh bread, and it's thought it's because she was starving and having hallucinations about fresh food. And she added, even here on the, hev on the road to heaven, there is a mountain range to climb. So she knew she was close to the end, but still finding it hard. So it's very reassuring that soon after, probably two days after that letter was written, she had climbed the mountain and was with the Lord she had served so faithfully. So I give you these two ladies, 
both of whom, loved one of whom, is still alive and loving and serving Christ in the way God calls them. May we all hear the quiet voice of God's call and follow him. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Now, Tibor is going to bring us our Bible reading, which comes from Romans chapter 12. Thank you, Tibor. Today's reading is from the New International Version. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. It is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love, Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Thank you, Tibor, and may God bless reading of his word and our reflection on it, which will follow after the offering. You will now be waited upon for your free will offering. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of sharing the bounty that we enjoy. We ask that uh, your love and mercy will reach into every home and heart and that the gospel will spread around the world and that by our giving this, uh, which we bring now and all that we offer and are, we ourselves might participate in your great redemptive enterprise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to sing again. This time it's the hymn, it's Isaac Watts' hymn. I remember when uh, young Artie here was living in London. We were living just around the corner from the uh, cemetery in which Isaac Watts is buried, and there's a large statue of him there. And this is one of his great hymns. And some of you just occasionally might receive an email from me, and I quite often at the end of my emails say blessings abound which is a phrase that comes from this hymn Jesus shall reign watch for it it's 388 in the blue book Alistair and it's 144 in the red book and it's on the screen 
Here we go. Please be seated. Well, I want to uh, continue that series that we began last week. Uh, so this is our second reflection on the phrase, one another, which is found in the New Testament a hundred times. Last week we took our focus in John's Gospel, chapter 13 and chapter 14, where twice Jesus says to his disciples that his command is to love one another. And as we read the New Testament, we discover, as I've mentioned, this phrase repeated many times, and it's a reminder to us as Christian people how we should treat one another, and not just each other in the church, but others beyond the church. It's about our relationships. So today we turn to the passage which Tibor read to us, Romans chapter 12, and I want to pick up on verse 5 in particular, but I'm going to remark on the whole letter as well. Verse 5, in the version that I'm using, uh, says, We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, I... I in Tibor's version, I think it says each other. Is that correct, Tibor, in the NIV? Uh, but the, the actual Greek word is the same. It's this one word, which I mentioned last week, alelon, is the Greek word. One Greek word, but it's translated by two English words. So uh, this, is, this is our theme this morning. And I, I want to uh, uh, explain that as we look at members of one another, I've used an image, uh, the image which you see on the leaflet this morning. I don't know how many of you have read uh, Bill Bryson's book on the body. Bill Bryson is a, 
He's not a medical specialist. He's, a, he's, a, he's an author of you know, travel books and uh, he has, a, uh, I think, a gentle sense of humour and I, I must say I enjoyed reading his book on the body. He's written, actually, a brief hit, history of nearly everything. It's another of his books. So if you want a, a book that's reflective, it's entertaining, it's a little bit challenging, uh, his books are, are, can do that. And his book on the body picks up on the wonder of the human body and, uh, and the human body is amazing. So as we think about being members of one another, I want to think, first of all, what it means to be one body in Christ because that's what the apostle is saying here. And I want to think about we though many. What did that mean to the apostle Paul when he got to chapter 12 of this long letter? And then where individually we belong to one another. What exactly does that mean? And if you look at the leaflet, you'll see that beside each of these three points, so it's in the leaflet, so I'm not assuming you're going to remember what I'm saying, but you can see it here. Beside each of these points, I've written these things. One, the centrality of Christ. Christ is central to the church. Two, the church as a divine reality. There's something about the church which is different from other organizations. It's a divine reality, the presence of the church in the world. And the third thing is a community of love, which of course bears directly on what I was trying to say last week. It gives me an opportunity to clear up anything that was unclear then. But also, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to say why I've used these three terms a little later on in our time of reflection. And here's Bill Bryson's book on the body, just reminding us that the body is amazing. In the ancient world, the body was a metaphor for unity. You can see that here, but it wasn't just in the Bible. People saw the body and they thought of it as a, an example of how different things can work together. Different parts can, can each contribute something. Uh, in the modern world, as we, as we look at the body, uh, with Brill Bryson's help, it's, uh, I, mean, I remember, uh, it must have been 40 years ago, my, my very first, when I went to Scotch College as a, as a chaplain with no chaplain experience, well that's not quite true, I'd worked in schools for 11 years, but I went to, I'd never been a full-time chaplain, but one of the things that struck me was this lesson that I had picked up on on the eye. Christine talked about the eyes, was it just last week? Yes, it was. And behind, at the back of each eye, your eyeball, you have 250 million photosensitive cells which pick up colours. Isn't that amazing? And not only that, but, but they, they see in stereo. So that if you've only got one eye, you lose your sense of depth of field. I used to get boys to close one eye, hold a finger out like this, and put the other finger down on top of it. Sometimes you miss if you close one eye because you don't actually see the depth of field. Once you, once you get the hang of it, you can manage it okay, but, and I suppose people with one eye generally manage okay. But there's a challenge for it. And then the ear. I remember thinking about those three tiny bones, the three smallest bones in your body. They're inside your ears. And the amazing thing about hearing. And I remember bringing... Um, uh, Sonia's dad, Graham Clark. Graham Clark, to speak at school because he, he developed the bionic ear. I never thought Sonia would be in our church one day and her dad, uh, you know, here's the man that I had brought to school all those years ago to talk about this. And at the time when I heard that they were trying to work on our bionic ear, I thought, well, I was really a naysayer. How could that be done? And Professor Clark said all the time he was working on this, people said it can't be done. Medical people said it can't be done. Doctors around him said it can't be done. You know, you're reaching too far here. But no, he was looking to try and create something like what we have in our, in our, in our ears. So the Bible draws on the wonder of the body. And in the modern world, as we know more about the body, the wonder only increases. The Psalms reflect on the wonder. Psalm 139 and other Psalms pick up on this idea. And nowhere more than the New Testament is the image of unity of the body developed uh, it, as much as, as uh, 
I think I got that the wrong way around. Nowhere as much as in the New Testament is the idea of the unity of the body developed. And in Romans chapter 12, we have the climax of the uh, carefully developed statement of the Bible. In this letter, the apostle is writing to Christians who uh, he hasn't met them yet. And he explains the gospel carefully. And he's telling them, firstly, the story of the hopeless situation. Everything we do is spoiled. We, we bring our own sort of corruptibility to our tasks. The best we can offer to God is so flawed that it needs to be redeemed. Humanity is a dead loss. Romans chapter 3, the apostle says this. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. We always bring our own flawed nature to what we do. But God... That's the word, but God. You'll find that expression several times in the letter of the Romans. But God comes to us and he brings healing. He, just as he did with Abraham, coming graciously, he comes and invites faith, encourages us to trust him. And it's not just Abraham and his descendants. God has no favorites. God is working to redeem humanity, the whole human race. Trusting in the promises of God, Abraham and his descendants looked forward to the redemption that God would accomplish. And since Christ, descendants of Abraham and others from the Gentile world have looked back and seen how God did this. He brought mercy and justice together in the person of Jesus and in his death, in the penalty that he experienced. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, so halfway between where we read today and the beginning of the book, uh, that uh, Christ, the Messiah, died for us while we were still sinners. So our peace with God comes on the same basis as Abraham's peace with God through faith. And being baptized uh, unites us with Christ. It's a picture of being connected with Jesus, of being washed by Jesus, of being re revived by Jesus, of, of being uh, nurtured and growing in Jesus. In Christ, says Paul, uh, believers are forged into one body. We are connected to all those who find in Christ their life. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the apostle doesn't just have the image of the body as a metaphor for unity, but he, he, he develops it further and says that Christ is the head of the body. So when God looks at his church, he sees it in Christ, in the beloved. Everyone is incorporated then into Christ, into Christ for, uh, and is precious to God. So in a sense, we have a new kind of family but it's more than that. It's richer than that. To be in Christ is a place of unimaginable richness. And just as I'm taking you through some of the passages in the New Testament in the next couple of weeks, where the Apostle and Jesus talk about one another, in the same way we could look at the passages which talk about being in Christ or in him. And I'm sure if I said to you, can you think of a passage where it says, in Christ we have, you could probably scrounge around and find something in the recesses of your mind. In him we have redemption. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him is life. In him, well, there's a whole string of things that are in him. There's a whole vast treasure chest of ideas connected to that expression. To be in Christ then is not just to be connected to one another, which is what we're looking at today, but it's like lifting the lid of a treasure chest and discovering that God is pouring wealth into our lives. Blessings abound wherever he reigns. So we, though many, well, many, We've got 50 people on our list, roughly. Uh, we're not that many. What do we mean here? What, how many are we talking about when Paul says, we though many are one body? 
Well, he knew that already, although he hadn't been to Rome, the church in Rome was growing. We know that later on uh, we get a message in the book of Acts that the, uh, the Jews were expelled from Rome. Why were they expelled from Rome? Well, we don't actually know, but it's probably because of the issue of the Christian faith reaching Rome and, and the Jews being, uh, being, becoming more visible in the community than was expected as they discussed the question of the Messiah. We, though many... When Paul says many, he knows about that rapidly growing church and that the message of Jesus is starting to change the world. The church is, and the word in the Greek language is ekklesia. It's the word we get ecclesiastical from. Ek means out of, and kalio is to call. God is calling out a people, and he's using the message, Our faltering words. He's using our message about Jesus to get to people and to touch people's lives. And in the New Testament, it's always people. The church, the ecclesia, is always people. Sometimes it's people gathered like we are this morning. Sometimes it's thinking about people spread throughout the world. The church throughout the whole area had peace, we read in the New Testament. And so, but it's always people, and it's always people in Christ. The idea uh, came later, although it's the idea we, <laughs> of the church as a building uh, or an organization came much later on. The, no, the, church, the, the New Testament never thinks of the church as a building and it doesn't think of it as an organization. Uh, it thinks of it as an organism. It's a living thing. It does need to be organized. There are jobs to be done in the church. And so it has elements of organization, more or less. Uh, and it does require, to, if it's meeting, it has to meet somewhere. Initially, they uh, went and met in houses. And the message was shared in synagogues. It was shared in public places, wherever sharing took place. The Apostle Paul rented the lecture hall of Tyrannus for a year and a half in Corinth. So wherever people could share the message, it was shared. But we need to see the organic reality beyond the organizational structure and beyond denominational peccadilloes. We need to ask, is the DNA of Jesus there? Does every professed Christian community reveal the mind of Christ? To what extent does it? So in history there have been times of great oppression Christine referred to uh, uh, Jane Henning, uh, Haining, and, uh, and I didn't expect that we would both be going there this morning, but um, I want to take you to a place where the Christian church was very poorly uh, represented by its churches. In, in a country in, in Nazi Germany, the Christian church, by and large, went along with the, the Nazi uh, propaganda. This man, this is his, this young man, it's hard to get a photograph of this man because he was, uh, well, his history was such that, uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of photos, but this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This is his uh, student passes when he went to uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York. He was a young German minister in the Lutheran Church and he had ministered for a year in Switzerland uh, he was from a well-connected German family. His grandfather had been chaplain to the Kaiser. His father was the premier sort of uh, psych psychiatrist in Germany at the time. His whole family was well-connected. And this is Bo Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he wrote a book called Life Together. And you can just see that there in the darkness on the screen. He was honored by a 100 Deutschmark stamp at one particular point in history. Um, and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in this book, Life Together, talks about uh, what the church is like. And he's, he, he could have stayed in America and avoided the war. Union Seminary wanted him to stay. and get, They would have given him a place, teaching place, because he was a brilliant man. But he felt, no, he had to go back. He went back via England. He talked to 
He had church people there, and then he went back into Germany. And he opposed Hitler, and he took the line that the church had to be doing certain things. And if you read this book, Life Together, and I've only read snippets of it, uh, but I've also read the Wikipedia entry, and this is what I wanted to refer to you. In the Wikipedia entry uh, to this, uh, this book, Life Together, you will find these three headings. The centrality of Christ, the church as a divine reality, and a community of love. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer was teaching these ideas in 1930s Germany. And the, the vast majority of churches had gone along with him. I think it was the last time Christine and I were in Germany, we, we visited a, a church in the north of Germany which had a display which was celebrating four martyrs from their town. One Lutheran and three Catholic priests who had all been killed by the Nazis because they were preaching the message that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was preaching. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was taken and imprisoned and two weeks before the end of the Second World War, two weeks, Hitler decided to have him killed and he was, he was executed. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a name we should know. His writings have had a profound impact on the post-war church. But at the same time, there was another man, and this is a, an image uh, of uh, Martin uh, Neymoller. Neymoller. So it should be a no with an umlaut. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that. But uh, he, he is famous uh, because some of his words from one of his speeches have been cast as a poet, poem. And, and you may have heard them because he says this. He, was a, he survived the war. He, he lived uh, until 1984. And he says, first they came uh, for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then he said they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. So you'll find these words in numerous places around the world, especially connected with the Holocaust and the, the United Nations. And, and so the question, the question that he's writing is, uh, to whom are we connected? Uh, how, uh, well, the, the answer is that uh, we belong to one another in the church. Individually, we belong to one another. The fundamental confession of all Christians is that Jesus is Lord. I'm seeking to let Jesus be Lord of my life. That's a challenge uh, because I don't always want to go along with what I believe Jesus has said. It's too difficult. Maybe it was just for those days. I have all sorts of ways of wriggling out of difficult uh, requirements or obligations. And I said last week that words are cheap, and Jesus makes it clear that he doesn't want just words from us. Remember the end of the Sermon on the Mount? How does it end? It ends with the story of the two men who built their houses, one on the sand and one on the rock. And the answer, the question at the very end, or that, that story is meant to teach is, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. It's not about hearing it's about hearing and doing. And so St. Paul presents us with the body in, in Christ. And we are individuals. We are different from each other. We, we're not meant to sink our differences. We're meant to exploit our differences. We're individuals. We have different graces, different gifts, different starting points in life, different languages. All sorts of things about us are different. But we're each endowed with our Creator because as we belong in the body of Christ, our purpose as Christians is to contribute to the health of Christ's body so that the world around us starts to feel its healing presence. How can we keep the body of Christ healthy? How can we keep our church healthy? Well, it's our differences that enable us to support one another in this enterprise. And as you listened to Tibor read earlier, I hope you picked up on the many differences that are mentioned in this 12th chapter of the letter to the Romans. Let me ask three questions. 
which I think pick up on this idea, a kind of health report, looking for the DNA of Jesus. We have to assess these criteria. Do we have a personal connection to Jesus? That is to say, is the organization and the ritual is it the organization and the ritual that matter to me or is it my hope in Jesus Christ is is my hope in him and that's a that's a primary thing if the church is in Christ i need to know that it's Jesus who matters that i don't go along because i have some social need for a company the church will provide that i'm sure or it ought to but that's, that's, that's not what makes you part of the church. What makes you part of the church is that the love of Christ reaches to you through those relationships. Or do I have an opportunity, second thing, the DNA of Jesus, do I have an opportunity to contribute? Uh, what can I share? What can I offer the church? Do I have long experience? Is that my length of experience? Is it something that... Other members of the church benefit from? The fact that I have time to pray for people? One of the things that struck me recently is that praying for people takes more time than I really want to give it. Um, it's, if a name is mentioned when we're praying, I don't take the time I believe I should to think about that person. The name is mentioned, and, but this. If you dwell on it, you know, you spend longer, of course, with uh, your own family and those you know more intimately. But um, when it comes, for example, to sick people, uh, there's, a, there's a long list of people. And do I enter into the position of those people? So do I have the time for prayer? Do I have the energy to keep learning? Am I growing? Are my, are my uh, skills and abilities available to the church. So we ask ourselves, uh, what can I offer? And the third thing, uh, DNA of Jesus, is we're looking for connectedness to one another. Do the other worshippers matter to me, the other people in church? Is there antipathy or warmth in my relationships with them? I, uh, I spoke at a meeting of just uh, boys schools uh, teachers some years ago and I used five criteria put out by by uh, two Christian people Schluter and Lee Michael Schluter in particular developed the thing called the relationships foundation he believed and he's done a lot of work on relationships in the British prison system and, and in other organizations you can think about relationships in an organization, even from a Christian point of view. And he, he said, for example, when you think about the relationships that you have, he says, uh, we need to think of five things, commonality, continuity, directness, parity, and multiplexity. I'm not expecting you to remember this. There's no test afterwards, all right? But, for example, commonality, is the relationship mutual? Do, I, do we enjoy each other's company? And you generally know whether you enjoy each other's company. The second thing is continuity. Does it endure over time or is it just for a purpose? Do we relate to each other because we have to do this and then it's over? Or does it endure over time? And how much time? And, and, and another thing is uh, directness. Is it immediate or not? When I say immediate, I mean without media. Face-to-face uh, -face is immediate. Mediated is with social media or emails or letters or uh, telephone calls. So there are other ways of, of mediating. Is, is my relationship direct? And then this parity. Is my relationship on the same level? That is, is there a power disparity in the relationship? Do I do these things because he's my boss? Or do I do these things because he knows something about me that I, I don't want him to share or... Or, or is it an even relationship? It might be a, a relationship at work, but is it still there after work? Do we play squash together or cricket or something else? Is the relationship something that uh, shows her on the same level? 
And multiplexity is over that range of styles. Uh, so I've got mixed up with parity and multiplexity. So, so Schluter and Lee have actually done work for organisations, but I think what they're doing, and I was using it in connection with school relationships between staff and staff and students and the running of a school. But we need to think about it in terms of our own church. And so I want to leave you with those five questions that we've put on order. Personal connection to Christ must be first. And then an opportunity to contribute. Do you feel that opportunity to contribute? And then finally, connected to one another. So when you come to church, do you think, I'll go to church this morning? Or do you come thinking, I'm part of the church. This is me here. I have a share in what happens. May God bless us, uh, all of us, and may we contribute to the health of uh, this part of Christ's body as we participate and share with each other more and more. May that love that we were looking for last week be found in our relationships here. Amen. Now I have a prayer that I want to share with you. So shall we join together in in a word of prayer. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of the universe, we worship you. Lord Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord of the world, we worship you. Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the people of God, we worship you. O Lord our God, Holy Trinity, Glorious beyond our comprehension, we worship you in the unfathomable mystery of your divine being, awed by all that is ours in Christ our Lord, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, in whom we receive adoption into the family of God, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom we receive every spiritual blessing in heaven and on earth. We come before you as one body here, united with Christians of every culture, language, race, country, generational, demographic, and every period of human history, to ask you to bring honor to the name of Jesus through the dynamic and unifying commitment of each one of us to the well-being of the whole body. Create in us a love of your church. We pray for those we know who are physically unwell today, some from our own congregation who suffer each day, perhaps the infirmities of age, some with chronic ill health, and others with significant and life-threatening illnesses. In the silence of our hearts, we name them before you now. We are grateful that we have been spared the worst impact of the COVID infection and we pray for all who have lost loved ones in this pandemic. We lament the squabbles among the nations about the COVID vaccine rollout. As rich and poor nations have shared in the trials of numerous vaccines, enable both poor and rich to benefit in equitable ways from the vaccines themselves. As our children have gone back to school, we pray for an educational year for them that enables them to mix with school friends and experience all the beneficial learning that comes from participation in class, in teams, in choirs, in orchestras, in casts, and in crews. We pray for the leaders of the nations in the complex situations they face, which include historic injustices and entrenched privilege, may they pursue justice, righteousness, and peace. We think of the many years of conflict within the Central African Republic, our country of focus today, and ask that you will cause the gospel to be heard in such a way that the civil war will come to an end and that rich, the rich resources of this small nation will bring benefit to the whole country. 
as the message of Jesus is shared in our own land and in lands and languages unknown to us. We ask that people will discover in the gospel the blessing that makes rich and to which there is no added sorrow. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The hymn is Amazing Grace, number 386. I don't think it's in RCH, but it's on the screen. may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one triune God, rest upon and remain with each one of you and with the whole Church of God. Amen. Amen.